Hello and welcome here at this very special EAO Just Ask, your monthly appointment <clears throat> with a leading expert in implant dentistry. And this is a very special edition, first of all, because it's only two weeks after the last one. And in this edition, we not only have one leading expert in implant dentistry, but we actually have a panel of three, which whom we're going to connect all across the globe and talk about what will happen in a, a, a dentist practice with a situation of COVID that we're dealing about right now. So what happens if life opens after lockdown with a COVID virus still around? My name is Gerrit Heikop and I'm the host of this EEO channel and I will guide you through this interactive hour because we will first listen to our three experts short presentations and then like you're used to we will try to answer as many of the questions of, of your questions that you have and we can already see that many of you are using the live chat functionality here on youtube if you're not doing that yet please share who you are and where you're joining us from and connect with all the colleagues across the globe that we see we see people from philadelphia from brazil from france albania italy thailand greece we're truly once again with a big international crowd this is how it works submit your questions and we'll I'll try to relay them to our panel because we have three very distinguished guests with us we have professor Nikos Mateus who is in based in Hong Kong and he is a leading expert in implant dentistry and has a lot of knowledge about the situation in Asia we are also joined by professor Dr. Man Yi from Chengdu in China. He is the uh, uh, um, chief of the oral implantology department at the West China School of Stomatology in Sichuan, at the Sichuan University. But I first would like to kick off with the initiator of this very special Just Ask, Dr. Michael Payet from Grasse in Austria, who is also a member of the EEO uh, Communication Committee, who is in charge of all these monthly uh, Just Ask. Michael, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Gary. It's hello from Austria. It's a pleasure Michael. to be back here with you on, on the Just Ask session. Yeah, for our loyal fans, we already did a session in November about ceramic implants. But this time you said, I would like to uh, have a special edition about the implant dentistry field around, during, after these uh, quarantine measures and, and dealing with COVID-19. So I'm curious, what, what is the key thing that you would like to learn or, or discover this afternoon? In fact, that's, that's right. Today we have the privilege of um, inviting or in, of welcoming two experts in the field of implant dentistry coming from China. So my role this time is more as a co-host and uh, maybe a co-moderator. It's a great privilege to, to do this next to you as a professionalist. And um, but these two experts from China, they are willing to share with us um, their experiences um, in dental practice during the pandemic of COVID-19. But also, and I think this is um, crucial and also very new in this setup as, as time has been passing. But so they will share also their steps and precautions and measures of how they are going back to a regular dental practice. So. Yeah, and that's that's interesting, right? Because it might give us a little opportunity, at least here in Europe, of what we can expect in the weeks and months to come, because the virus was there earlier, but they're also opening them up a little earlier than we are. So we hope to get as many practical examples as we want. Now, you prepared a little introduction for us of, of why this session is important. Could you could you please uh, introduce that in, to our audience? Yes, with, with pleasure. Uh, so before we really start to jump into the topic of, of COVID-19, I would just like to give some brief updates of uh, in facts around the pandemic situation. And by that, it may also become clear why uh, the EEO um, as a scientific association felt mostly a responsibility uh, towards the dental community, uh, not only to just ask, but also to, to just inform dental practitioners uh, in order to hopefully contribute also um, in a meaningful way to fight against the spreading, the further spreading of the virus. Um, in fact, it's like this, what makes COVID-19 so dangerous is really its enormous velocity of global spreading. And this is due to its, to its really high contagiosity. 
So uh, just to give you some numbers, as of today, we um, have confirmed over 2.5 million infected cases worldwide and over 100 or around 100,000 people dying uh, from COVID-19. And this really all around the globe. So it's, it's, this has been happening you know, in 213 uh, countries so far. So this corresponds also, and this is, I think, a, um, a key number to, uh, to a global average death rate of almost 7%, um, which is um, really high. And this means also um, that COVID-19 is really something totally different than a seasonal flu, where we um, know um, um, death rates of around uh, and or even lower. So, however, this is really dramatic numbers, uh, but parallel to this to this situation, and also so far to this unique global lockdown. There also seems, as you mentioned, it because time has been passing and restrictions are showing their their effect. Um, we can see in some countries that the number of new infections is rapidly decreasing, and we also can see an increasing number of uh, recoveries being reported in some countries. So in these countries, we can also follow a slow restart of the economy, which really is having tremendous effects, which we cannot estimate to its full extent uh, by now. And we can also see um, health systems and as, uh, as well um, as dental practitioners going back to, to normal or more normal work by because during the uh, pandemic in most of the countries only dental emergencies have been have been treated um, and um, so we will definitely and this is something what we're really looking forward um, get insights into specific restrictions and also personal protect, uh, protection measures from um, our two experts that have proven to be effective in observations, but we can see also uh, first clinical studies being um, highly in, published in highly ranked journals within the field of dentistry. So um, as China is one of the first countries that has been exposed to COVID-19, um, this is, it makes a lot of sense also to ask um, dental practitioners from this environment to give us, to share their information, to share their experiences with us, to share their conclusions. Um, and so it's, this really has to be of utmost interest uh, for all of us really waiting for, for getting back to a more uh, normal uh, way of dentistry now. So. It is yeah. really a great privilege. You, you briefly introduced um, our experts a little bit, but uh, I think, Garrett, uh, we will just jump into the topic and I will briefly introduce our first expert. Um, it's Professor Nikos Mateos um, from China, from Hong Kong. Um, he's a periodontist, a very active researcher. I had the privilege of um, doing several research together with him. He's also a very active active academic teacher, um, as we can see in his curriculum, has directed postgraduate programs in Australia and Hong Kong. And uh, what is also interesting, and this is something we might maybe address a little bit later, uh, Professor Mateos is also a leading expert in online education, which has really become of, of high relevance also during, during the shutdown. So maybe we can address this in the second phase also. And um, Professor Nick Amateus. He's a visiting professor uh, in Thailand, in Bangkok, at the Chula Longkorn University. But what is of special interest for us today, he has been maintaining a private practice in Hong Kong. So he can give us really clear insights of what has been happening in China. So. Interesting. Uh, let's uh, let's invite him to our virtual stage here. In the meantime, I see all our uh, uh, the people who are participating, and it, it appears to me there's a lot of people from Thailand uh, joining. So I think uh, uh, Professor Nikos Mateus has invited his network as well. But then we also see a lot of people, uh, some regular faces. Lawrence uh, from South Africa is with us. We have people from Athens, Cyprus. So if you're just joining us, please at the beginning use this little chat function to introduce yourself. So we actually have have some 
togetherness feeling of all the people joining virtually in these crazy times. Probably um, a lot of you are dealing with partially or fully locked down clinics. So that allows you the time to actually be bearded. Michael, I understood this is your first day back at the university, right? And uh, back, back in business, so to speak. That's, that's right, yes. So In the meantime, I'm asking Nikos to join us on this virtual stage. There okay. he is, yes. Thank you. Am I online now? Very you are good. fully online. Welcome, uh, <laughs> welcome, and we're very glad that you're with us. Dear Michael, dear Gerrit, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for the initiative to organize a session like that, and even more for the opportunity to actually have uh, the chance to get here and, and share some of our thoughts with so many colleagues all over the world. Now, as you just said, it is a very special session. What is special from my part is that I'm going to be talking about things that I'm not really a leading expert into for, for a very great part of them. Uh, in contrast, maybe to all the previews just asked, where the people who were speaking actually mastered their domain. But as you said, this is a time of togetherness. I think this is a key word. So in times like that, information is important. When we don't have the evidence, we don't have the experience ourselves, it's very important to share, to communicate, and collectively come up with things that will help us do a better service to our patients and, and a better service to wherever field we're actually placing ourselves into. So with this, I would like to bring you a greeting from uh, Hong Kong. Good evening. And uh, I would like, before I move on and discuss a bit more specific about dentistry in the times of the pandemic, uh, I would like to give you an idea of how Hong Kong has experienced this pandemic because this will help you also place the setup where dentistry is being uh, demanded and, and offered during these three months. So if I may start a small presentation here, yes, just to illustrate a few points of what we're going to talk about. Uh, Hong Kong has been one of the very first places exposed to the virus. Of course, this is uh, no surprise. Uh, but when it comes to some essential benchmarking dates, I think I would say the 9th of January, that was the first official communication that we received as healthcare workers from the government with an official information from the health authority. We Nikos, actually... before you move on, one quick yes. uh, technical remark. There's a pop-up over your uh, presentation on the bottom right uh, about your effects. So if you uh, close I'm that, sorry. yes, that one. Yeah, Thank no, no problem, no problem. But uh, <laughs> there we go. Yes, thanks. Yes, so everyone, so... Can, everyone can see we're really live. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I hope nothing happens behind the curtain. Is uh, No, 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 no. I, I will cover you. Thank you. So our first uh, cases, the first confirmed cases were quite early, were on the 23rd of January. And this is actually just before the Chinese New Year, which is a very special date. It's probably the biggest mobility throughout the year that takes place during the Chinese New Year in, in this part of the world. So we had two confirmed infections on the 23rd of January, which now places us three months down the road. And uh, today we are slightly above 1,000 confirmed infections, and we have uh, four deaths attributed to the coronavirus. So what happened throughout these three months that we are uh, fulfilling today? Uh, I think we saw more or less uh, most of the things that we have seen all over the world. And there was some initial confusion. There was some uh, initial panic runs to supermarkets occasionally here and there there was uh, pretty much the whole spectrum of responses and reactions. But I think all in all, when we look now where we stand and how this was managed throughout the three months, I think there has been a quite a successful control of the contagion. If you want to get a little bit of a better understanding of, of what happened during these three months and where were the main uh, factors that influence this condition. There was a very nice study recently published in The Lancet. It comes from a, from a team in Hong Kong U, which reviews the non-medical measures and the non-pharmaceutical measures that have been taken uh, in Hong Kong in order to contain the contagion. So essentially what this study shows is that uh, Hong Kong has managed to tiptoe in a very, very fragile balance throughout these three months. 
and has successfully more or less maintained the transmissibility around one, which is a very critical point and, and allows for the society to operate without uh, having a very, very fast and detrimental spread of the disease. Now, we never entered a complete lockdown in Hong Kong. There was never a case of everyone being forced to stay home. But there was a lot of early measures. There was um, a very early, very active uh, tracing, tasty, testing of people and tracing, and then quarantine, quarantine for all those who have been potentially exposed. There was also social distancing measures introduced rather early. There was increasing border restrictions and controls. And I think the combination of closing certain parts of the business, for example, in the last three weeks, we have a shutdown of entertainment venues and gyms and bars. But uh, the majority of the other business are moving on. Restaurants are still working with some social distancing uh, regulations. So I think there has been a balanced uh, response which allowed the majority of the people to maintain uh, reasonably uh, balanced lifestyle and also the business to operate. Now, uh, moving on, there is, of course, a lot of information being made available by uh, the authorities. And I think this is a very important part because there is a lot of tracking of everything. And all this information is being made available in real time. Not only information about what to do, uh, but also information about the actual spread of the disease in the community, about the services available, about the regulations, and so on. What impresses me most is maybe the real-time dashboard where you have information about each and every confirmed case. So here you see how effective tracing has been and how a great tool it is. Not only you can see the buildings where confirmed cases have uh, resided, but you can also see the whereabouts if they were imported or if there were local transmitted infections, and uh, also how the cause of the disease have evolved, where they have been hospitalized and when discharged, and all this in a real-time interactive dashboard. So you can actually see your neighborhood, see your building, see the neighboring buildings, the venues, and get information in real time about what happens. When it comes to imported cases, there is even more available information. So each and every one of these cases that was coming from overseas, you can actually trace down the exact seat they had on the plane. So you can see that there was a case, for example, here that traveled from London, and he was having the flight CX-252, which landed on 16th of April, and he was sitting on the seat 60J. So if you were flying in this flight, you are called immediately to report and somehow you stay on a self-quarantine or depending on the risk assessment. So I think information is essential. It makes people uh, assess the extent of the problem. It gives people a better understanding of how we're moving on, where do we progress? And, and I think it gives also a, a it calms down and realistically helps everyone to understand where we're moving at and what is coming after that. Now, I might also add to this something that I believe is a very important feature, and I would dare to call it uh, as a behavioral immunity. I don't think there is a term like that, but I believe very firmly that our behavior is predisposing the community towards trouble, towards spread of the infection, or can actually become a protective factor. And that was one of the major things that we saw in Hong Kong. The population here, the people of Hong Kong, they have very, very quick reflexes. And uh, it is very well illustrated in scientific research just published. This is a paper that I previously quoted from Hong Kong U in The Lancet. There was some survey among the population about three different time points. The first time point is on the 20 to 23 of January. And that was before we even get a confirmed case of uh, COVID in Hong Kong or an infection. And you can see already at that time, we actually have 74% of the people wearing face masks at their own initiative when in public. That was not a government measure. That was not a requirement. That was nothing. This was a response of the people hearing what happens in the nearby uh, Wuhan, what happens in Guangdong. So acting proactively to, to protect the community and protect their own health. And I think this is something very, very commendable. Today, if you look at the same study, it's 
percent of the people who are actually wearing masks. So they started early, and I think that has made, although I cannot really back it with the evidence, I, I do believe has made a difference. So today, where we practice dentistry is an environment that actually has a low prevalence of the infection. And I think this is of tremendous importance because the risk that you carry in the dental clinic is directly proportional to the risk of infection outside in the community. If you can somehow control the spread of the disease, then you can practice dentistry in an environment that carries less risks for everyone. And I think under this light, it's very important now to see where we're called to practice. Now, when it comes to the actual practice of dentistry, um, just before the Chinese New Year, so around the 22nd of January, we closed down for the holidays. Then the main university, the only dental faculty and the only teaching dental hospital did not open after that point. So it remained closed as of today. So the majority and the, the bulk of dental care was provided by private practitioners in the city. And this is mainly the case. Hong Kong doesn't have any um, big uh, providers of dental care from, from the public side. So the private dental clinics have been open throughout this time. They have not been really under any lockdown. Of course, the demand for dental services has been reduced dramatically. Most of our colleagues have seen less than 50% of their patients during this time. At the same time, at their own initiative, many dentists have also tried to see only essential or emergency services being provided. So, of course, we have kept a low level of essential dentistry, but nevertheless, it has never been uh, completely stopped or prevented. Now, there are many requirements and many recommendations and protocols. I will not stay into details because I think each and every uh, jurisdiction and each and every country might have issued similar things based on the conditions that they face in, in their communities. In Hong Kong, there was quite early on uh, guidelines coming from the Dental Association and also from the Center for Health Protection, uh, the Health Authority of Hong Kong. And uh, mainly these protocols uh, focus in certain areas that are quite uh, easy to understand mainly the screening of the patients, try to screen out patients who might not be into a, a direct need for dental care that can be postponed for a few weeks, and also screen out patients who have any risks because of their history, because of their travel history, because of contacts, or also patients who show up with uh, increased temperature and so on. The reception and waiting area, which now has to be very streamlined, I, I would prefer to not even have the waiting area, just get the patient admitted directly to the screening station and then straight to the dental chair. So minimize any time that the patient is spending idle in parts of the clinic, I think like the waiting area. The personal protective equipment, major discussion, huge discussion, ongoing discussion. I will re report a little bit about uh, our own experience so far. Further on the procedures, there is a strong um, suggestion to limit all procedures that generate aerosol. And with that, uh, ultrasonic scalers might be on the top of the list, but also the use of uh, air turbine and, and high-speed drills. But even the, the low speed drilling that we use in implant dentistry is also, to a certain extent, generating aerosol might be also a risky procedure. And of course, finally, disinfection, very, very strict disinfection of surfaces, of equipment, of any exposed potential surfaces and, and um, items in our clinic. Now, if I would go to the PPE to the personal protection equipment. Uh, this is the guideline that we are currently following from the health authority. As you will see, it is nothing really uh, dramatic. At the serious response level and the emergency response level, we are uh, using a surgical mask. And there is a recommendation to use an E95 if you are performing or you have to perform aerosol generating procedures. We're using, of course, eye protection, gown, gloves, and uh, optional cap. So nothing really dramatic to that stage. But of course, we have to see that this is general dentistry being practiced at the private clinic settings on asymptomatic and not confirmed cases. So these are the patients who walk in and walk out. And 
this is not the same as in a high prevalence area or in an area with an active, uh, very high transmission and high risks and so on. So this is how it looks like to give you a visual idea. This is the one and only single photo of myself in this equipment, which is especially made for the Just Ask EAO. And the reason this is the only one is because I have uh, very consciously refused to, to share photos of, of personal protective equipment. I have decided that I do not want to go into the temptation of, uh, of uh, although it looks very cool, to, to share photos like that, mainly because from the beginning there was a very, very heated discussion about what is essential, what is necessary, what is... Uh, working and what is not working. In reality, I think most of us had very little evidence and very little relevant data to work with. So we were all trying to find out what is the best way to secure that at least we offer the best services at the lowest possible risk. So that's usually how I would still see emergency cases when I have to see urgent cases in this month. There is again a cap surgical mask. This is a knee 95, mainly because I bought a lot of them because of the pollution, not for the virus. But you never know when things will come up and change. Of course, eye protection and a face shield, and then single gloves and a waterproof gown. And I think that would probably uh, be what I would see as, as a feasible and at the same time reasonably reducing any risks for private practice under the settings that we have here in Hong Kong. Now, this is also in accordance with many other recommendations I see internationally from other medical professionals. This is the same, for example, from the American Association of uh, Endoscopy. Uh, and you can see the standard PP in low prevalence area. There is uh, some small additions if you have high prevalence area. Of course, from this point, you can start adding up and adding up. And uh, some of the things I do not really understand. I have to admit, for example, I'm still struggling to understand why would someone need to have double disposable gloves? I haven't, I haven't really found a convincing answer yet. There must be some reason, but I can't really get it. Maybe someone will know from the audience to help me on that. And of course, there is all these kind of uh, space suits that people are posing with in, in really... Uh, more fancy equipment, which, however, is for hospital use with confirmed cases and with people who are actively sick. I think there is a, a big difference in that way. First of all, because these professionals are exposed uh, to, to the actual disease and the virus. The virus load that is released by these people who are actively sick uh, is, is totally different to the asymptomatic ones that we might also see. And of course, there is very, very different protocols I do not see yet in our settings of, of something like that being necessary in the regular uh, outpatient practice that we have. Now, of course, it goes on and on. There is a big discussion, and I think many people have been acting on the basis of the available information, and the information that is available is at least confusing in many aspects. I don't know if you have seen this graph. It's a very spectacular graph. It is titled, The Workers Who Face the Greatest Coronavirus Risk. It comes from the New York Times, very interesting article, and a very well-written article. The funny thing about it, it points the dentists at the very end of the right corner. If you are a dentist and you see this, you better change job, because you actually are much more likely to get coronavirus than the nurses, for example, who are working in the hospital environment with disease. And the only one who is more at risk than the dentist is the hygienist. Now, these pictures travel fast. They're, we're all visual. And because it's a scary picture as well, it becomes even faster. And I think it was many people who got to see this in the first uh, days of, uh, of the pandemic. And the question is, however, the text that comes with it, the real article that comes with it, is much more slow, much more heavy, and it, in the end is the picture that sticks. In reality, this classification, this picture, is not made by any data. There is no data backing this picture. There is no study behind it. There is no research. There is no evidence as such. There is not even any data set. It is, it is an assumption 
It's a clear assumption, which is very well done, and I think it has a purpose, but it is an assumption based on how close you work to your patient and also exposure to diseases, which is very, very difficult to define. So if you're a nurse and you're working for eight hours in a ward with infected patients or sick patients even more, and if you're a dentist who are working for eight hours with asymptomatic some potentially carriers of the virus, I don't think there is any way to quantify it in that field. So I think the level of information we have is important to be weighted against the, their actual value before we overreact or we react in any way. Of course, we all, when we don't know, we err towards the safe side. There is no harm in trying to be overly protective, so we might see some extreme things. I think that as we move on forward, as we will realize more and more, and we will know more and more, and more evidence and experience will emerge, we will also fine-tune our protocols. One thing that I believe is very important is that in places like Hong Kong and Singapore, where the tracing has been extensively detailed, there is still not a single case where it is confirmed infection or even suspected infection to take place in the dental practice. So although we might see a graph that places up, up on the pin of the map and, and at a very highest risk, the reality is that this is not confirmed by the practice. We have not seen this happening in Hong Kong. We have not seen this happening in Singapore. And I think that might mean that the risks that we're facing are not really at the initial uh, placed level. So what will happen now? I think we are already after the COVID and uh, dentistry will have to adjust. The after the COVID doesn't mean that we're over. I think this is going to be a long process. It's going to take a long time before we can actually uh, feel that the pandemic or the risk of the virus is uh, eliminated. And we will have for long periods of time to practice together with the virus together with the risk for a new epidemic, either focused or, or spread, uh, because dentistry is not uh, cosmetic. Dentistry is an essential service, essential care. You can put it off for a couple of weeks. You cannot hold it inevitably. So we have to open up and we have to practice and we have to learn how to do it with the least possible risk for the community and for ourselves. Virus epidemics, I think, will stay with us for quite uh, a long time. And of course, there is a lot of information we do not know right now, and we have to somehow quantify. For example, aerosols are risky procedures, but how much and, and how really a threat is it? What are the measures that we can take to minimize them? What is the ventilation of the clinic and the design of the environment? There is anecdotal evidence coming from Guangzhou that I was reading the other day about infections taking place in a restaurant following a pattern that was directed by the proximity of the tables and the flow of the air through their condition. So we're talking about things that we can slowly start to understand. And once we get to quantify it, to pinpoint the right level of risk, maybe we will be able to address it much more efficiently. So we will have a lot of challenges and we do need a lot of research, data and collaboration to help each other adjust to, to the practice in the next few years. With that, I think I would like to sum up here my very uh, small introduction about Hong Kong. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I think I would like to introduce uh, the next speaker, if I may. Yeah, one, one second, uh, Nikos Penteos. Thank you very much for this uh, great presentation. As you mentioned, togetherness is important. And I just want to point out to everyone who joined us later, welcome. We're doing a special EEO Just Ask about what life is like after the lockdown and how we can start up our dental practices again. It's all about sharing information, you said, Nikos. And we see that is already happening also in our live chat. Because when you raised the question, and again, you promised, I don't want to go into discussions about people. PPE. Uh, but when you raised the question about double gloves, we saw that Lenka B and Guillem Estefpardo uh, immediately stepped in and started in the chat sharing why that could be useful and not. And we also see some first questions coming in, but uh, contrary to uh, the other EO just asked, we will save up the questions for the last bit of this session and we first move on, as you said, to our uh, next honorary speaker from uh, the Far East. Please go ahead, Nikos. Thank you very much. Actually, now you made it very, very interesting for me to check what are the 
comments. So without uh, <laughs> yes, any further delay, I would like to welcome Professor Man Yi, who is a very distinguished uh, professor in implant dentistry, but also a very good friend of, of mine and also of uh, us in Hong Kong here. He has been here many times contributing to our teaching, and he is directing the Department of Implant Dentistry in uh, the West China uh, School of Stomatology. Uh, so I think he has a very different perspective to offer to this discussion now from a big institute in uh, mainland China. So Professor Manhi, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for joining us. Hi everyone, thanks very much for introducing me and uh, also I'm not expert in implant dentistry and uh, I attend this basic implant in West China's hospital stomatology. Today I will talk about, you know, that the first outbreak of the coronavirus is in China. And uh, so what happened to us during the past three to two months? Do I have a share my screen? Okay. So is that clear about my presentation? Yes, okay, that's all working, uh, Professor Manyi. Great, go ahead. Okay, so, so because I'm the chief of the implant department, so what happened to us during the past two to three months? And we know that the first outbreak in Wuhan and then spread all over the world, as mentioned by Michael, and uh, the recent data is we have over 2.5 million confirmed cases of COVID-19. And how about my city? My city is Chengdu. It's about 1,000 1, kilogram kilometers from Wuhan, the first outbreak. And our size, our city size is one third of the hot land and our population is kind of like the same, 1.16 million people just in our city. So that is Chengdu and that is uh, West China School of Stomatology, the first dental school in China. So that is, we deal with that situation according to the government, the three levels, the emergency level one and the level two and the level three. I will just discuss in the later presentation. So according to the Chinese Dental Association, the survey about the, all the about the over 1,000 dentists, that implant dentistry could be affected the most by this pandemic. About 60%, 67% of the, of the dentists that thought it might be a fix. So this is a hospital, and this is a hospital and we have about 400 units. And our department have like 37 units, and we are in room C and in room B. So that is a part for us at the beginning. But for the emergency and the first emergency response level one, we are not allowed to do any practice for implants. And then that time, at the end of the January, and last for almost one month, a little bit more than one month, we can only do emergency. And that is our dean and our president of the university go to our university, go to our dental school to check everything is smooth, and we have enough facilities for that. And at the beginning for the emergency duty, everyone come to us, and still a lot of patients come to us, and they have to check and the gate of our hospital, they have to scan and write down the chart about the epidemiologic investigation. If they have been to Wuhan, or if they have the fever over 37.3, and they will just go to the designated hospital for the treatment. But if they are fine, and they don't have the epidemiologic history of going to Wuhan or someplace near that place, they can go to our dental school. And that's time for the emergency duty at an our dental school have two to three factors every day that kind of responsible for over 100 patients. But not everyone, of course, not everyone is treated. And we can see that that is the charts they have to fill, their name and their cell phone and their place they live. So that is for the emergency response level one. And that we only do emergency treatment. We wipe a lot and we put on gauze and that is, we call it the level two protection. And that's time for our department because no patient can come. And so we just broadcast how to treat their implant. And if they have something wrong about the losing healing apartment or the crown loosening, they don't have to come at that time because that time is quite risky for the patient and for us. 
and we contact with the patient with the internet, and we have a one practice just online for like almost at the work time, and just answer the questions from the, all the patients. And that is after about one month, and we almost have no no confirmed cases for a few days, and we just go to emergency response level two. And at that time, we kind of start our work step by step. We do not open our clinic. We do not open our hospital suddenly. We just open part of our hospital. That hospital can shut down the central air conditioner. And uh, we have telephone appointments of every patient. They have to arrive in time and leave in time. And we, in that time, we have only room D. And room C and room B is the biggest part. We don't treat any patient. In room D, and we have like we in room D, then the patient go to that part for the emergency treatment. And that is the first three levels of screening. The patient, if they want to get treatment in our hospital, they have to first screen at the gate of our hospital. And it's kind of like the same. If they have the fever like over 37.3, and they cannot go into the hospital because it might bring the risk to other patients. And then after the first screen, they will go to the register place to every department, and they will do the screen again. And they will write down form about how about the past, thing, past 14 days, where have they been? And then they will be screened by us, the factories, and that is me treating the patient. You can know that it's really hard for me at the beginning. I wear the goggles, I wear the gauze, and I wear the caps, and I treat the patient. It's really hard for me to do that at the beginning. So at that time, we only treat the patient with limited aerosol producing, and we just treat the patient like the second time surgery, second stage surgery, and it's three cements, some crown loosening, or just put back some pineal buttons. And a few days later, we get used to that environment, and we move to room D. And so for the room D, it's the, still the emergency response level two. And at that time, we just treat the patient, and we just resume our work step by step. And at that time, before we go back to our hospital, and at that time, two to three practices in our department can go back to hospital to treat the patient. And we have the online WeChat, and we discuss the details, where we should go, where the patient should go, and can the, one of the nurses are responsible to calling every patient to ask the details of every patient. And at that time, it's one Zoom, one patient, just once for one patient, one patient can come to one room and no other patient is in the same room. And can we do the appointment in advance and we have the level two protection. You can still see that they wear the gauze and the caps and wear the masks. It's a little bit different from the Lico's. We wear the N5, N95 in the inner part and we wear the surgical mask in the outer part. We just change the outer part about four hours later and we change to a new surgical mask and still keep that a 95. And that is our rule in our hospital. And about one month later after level two, almost no patient, almost, almost no new confirmed case in our city. We, the emergency response is to level three. And at that time, we kind of open and open. And we have like all our unit kind of go to open, but we have to keep a minimum operating distance more than three millimeter. And at that time, our screening system is improved. This is one of my postgrad students, and she is also a patient in the orthodontic department. When she wants to get treatment in the orthodontic department, and she has to screen in the gate of our hospital, and she write down all her information about the location and the cell phone and the future, and, they, and then she will get her card. And that is in the middle picture, you can get a card and then go to the department entry. And the nurses will just measure the temperature again and try and go to find the digital tracing system that could find where the patient have been to the last past 15 days. For this patient, that's one of my postgrad students. And she has been to Shanghai for the past thing, for the past 15, 14 days. So we know where she has traveled. And now that is our current situation in our department. So we don't use every unit. I just use, 
with a unit with a unitary interval, we keep three millimeters distance. And we can see that the protection method is different. If they do some aerosol producing procedure, we can see that one of the dentists wear the gauze and wear the facial face suit. And one of the dentists just wear the white coat because he just checks the patient. We try to just, it should be based on our clinical judgment and to treat a different kind of situation and save the facility and save the equipment for us. So that is the conclusion of our presentation. Now, now we can recover to like 90% of our weekly work. And for now, we work from Monday to Sunday because we have only 50% of the unit can be used. And from Saturday and Sunday, we still work. And for the holiday, we still work because we can just make a shift of that. And uh, we have recovered like 82%. We still do the surgery. And the first three months, we don't do any surgeries. But after three weeks of practice in our, in our department, we do surgeries now. So that is, we have to sum it up. We have the precautions throughout the whole procedure. We have online consultation and the distance learning during the whole procedure. And our PhD students will do our online basis defense tomorrow, tomorrow noon. And uh, we have to create, triage the patients and have to, have to manage and supervise all the procedures. So that is my conclusion of our presentation. And thanks for my team and thanks for my head nurse and our attending our department and my postgraduate students from all over China and from Thailand. And they prepare this presentation and together. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there I am. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Manyi. I uh, muted my microphone not to disturb you and then missed to open it. But um, thank you for that uh, clear story. And as I understand, you are back to 90% back in a normal uh, procedure. Well, not normal, but uh, at 90% capacity with all these measures uh, taking into place. Let me, let me close this circle through the world and take it back to Austria. Michael, you've been listening to these two stories and uh, you initiated this session from your personal career curiosity also. What have you just heard that, that helps you now in your first day that your university hospital is open again? So first of all, I would also like to thank uh, both speakers. Uh, both of them have really given us, us um, at least for me, very interesting insights. Um, as I hear from both presentations, and I think everybody agrees from that, that we will still need to live with um, all the measures to be taken within within the next couple of months, maybe maybe years, and um, <clears throat> so. Uh, but this also means that um, we will also, even if Nikos, if you do not want to address it, we need to um, think about at least personal protection equipment. And I don't know about the situation in China, but uh, I can speak about the European situation. This was at least in the high phase of the of the pandemic. This was quite a topic. Was the shortage of of equipment for dental practitioners? So has this been a topic in China as well, or were you well equipped? Who organized it? Who paid for that? So maybe that would be interesting also to to be better organized for for the future. Yeah, Nikos. Okay, yes, yes, there you are. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, you are right. It has been a situation here, and I think in the very early stages, uh, there was no supply chain good enough to, to make sure that everyone had access to all this equipment. There was a big shortage of surgical masks, not only because of, of um, the need in the, in the healthcare, but also because the general population had a very high demand for this. So, in the very early stages, there was also a lot of colleagues who closed their practices or reduced their practices because also of the lack of protective equipment. Now, as we move ahead, I think this will become less and less of a problem because the whole world is mobilized towards producing uh, personal protective equipment. So right now in Hong Kong, I do not think that we have any significant shortage. We can actually deliver the care at the level that we anticipate. And I believe that the rest of the world will follow because uh, 
it is only a matter of the production to catch up with the uh, extended needs. Now, if we do not have it, of course, we cannot practice. So we have to prioritize very carefully, strategize, but that is mainly on, on a level much higher than we move. It's, it's a, probably the government agencies have to make sure that there is enough equipment for all. Well, and regarding protecting ourselves, I think uh, we are joined by a larger crowd than we have ever been. And that means the live chat is very lively and people are zooming in a lot on the topic of air cleaning and air measures, both in the surgery room and in the hospital. And, and Professor Manier, in your presentation, you did show us a photo of an, uh, an air, air conditioning device. And you mentioned earlier today, temperatures are rising, you are using air conditioning now. Could you comment a little bit about what measures you are taking uh, in that area on, on how to decom decontaminate the air and, and other preventive measures? Okay, thank you very much. Very, very important question, and for the air in our in our departments, and uh, we have to put, we have to ventilate our room, and we keep the window open for all the time, and we stop our central air conditioner system, and we have the air conditioner air sterilizer. I think we call it the air sterilizer, which is ultra wireless, and we use it like three times a day during before we work, and. Uh, during the break, during the, for the lunch time, and after we work, we use three times a day to try to do our best to sterilize our environment. Of course, we have to wipe a lot between the patient. The patient has to stay a little bit longer and to wait a little bit longer. So that's the way we just try to sterilize our environment. And the air sterilizer is kind of improved a little bit. The air can below this machine and go up to this sky and it will not blow to us directly so we feel more comfortable than before okay and can you comment for example tom canning is uh, referring to that and also uh, uh, some other of our and uh, oh yeah there it is Toy Pedortol is the name, I want to uh, um, give credit to the question askers, about negative pressurized rooms, which is something contrary to opening a window, because uh, we read also that um, uh, Marianne Manset is, is, is writing that in France it's recommended to work with open windows, and obviously the whole negative room pressure will be difficult. Uh, what is your uh, experience there? I think it's kind of hard or unrealistic to use the negative pressure room in our hospital because I think in our hospital we just have one negative pressure room for the treatment. And uh, so most of the time we just ventilate as much as possible and to sterilize as much as possible to protect our faculties and the post grad students and the patients. Of course, the screening system is very important. We have to, when the patient comes to us, we have to lower the risk as much as possible. Yeah. So you say we 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 are we take preventative measures and screening measures earlier in the chain, so that yeah. once we are working with patients, we are more certain, or at least we have reduced the risk of having the virus in our environment. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, Nikos, what is your experience with air treatment, air sterilizing, opening windows? What what is the practice in uh, in, in what you. you know about? Yes, it's it's a very interesting discussion. If I may start also with the negative pressure room, because there's a lot of hype about it. But I think in reality, the only purpose of this facility is for hospital environments. If you have a hospital environment where you have confirmed cases and sick people who need care, because people with the virus also need care while they're in the hospital, emergency dental care cannot be denied to these people, then to prevent the aerosol from scattering into the hospital or the greater environment, you can use these negative pressure rooms. Now, for a regular dental care, it doesn't make sense because patients will come again and again, one after the other, and the contamination within the negative pressure room is, is still a fact, it's a reality. It's only to prevent it from spreading when you have confirmed cases. Now, it looks like the ventilation and the airflow is a significant factor and aerosol is a risk. So if we accept there is a viral road in, in the aerosol and the droplets, the question is always how do they circulate, which surfaces it will settle on, how do we protect ourselves? And this is something we know very little about. Unfortunately, all the data and all the information that we have been trying and struggling to read all this time, they refer to conditions which are very, very far away from the conditions we have in a dental clinic. 
Uh, I was looking at a lot of uh, people claiming, for example, the half-life of the aerosol in the air is about one and a half hour. So that means that it will continue being the air for one hour and a half before it settles. And then when you go to the original study that actually shows this, you realize that this is a very small box where they put the aerosol, which is also rotating. So it has nothing to do with an open clinic where there is an airflow, there is a ventilation. We have really no understanding of that. And I couldn't find any relevant studies that you can relate to. Unfortunately, much of this information comes from in vitro experiments on small boxes, which we can't relate. So I think in the future, we will need to quantify this risk because already now there is a lot of proposed solutions starting from extraoral suctions, from air purifiers, from manipulations of their condition. But I, I really don't know essentially what would be the best way to go. I think we really need to invest some time and effort to see within the settings of a proper clinic how this aerosol circulates, what is the actual risk, what is the viral load when it's uh, ultrasonic being actually used, and, and make some well-informed decisions. Well, thank you, Nikos, for sharing that. And especially, specifically in this context of EAO, where we pride ourselves in being scientifically driven and, and pointing out that that study, study is actually a very limited setup to be translatable into a big dental clinic is, is very important to point out, I think. On the other hand, you introduce more questions because basically now we don't know. Um, yes. Michael, a specific question kind of directed also to you from uh, Gianni Salvini. Um, first of all, she's asking, I guess, to all of us, can you give us as precise uh, possible indications about what kind of air sterilizers you use? Very practical. But also um, uh, to you, Michael, in, in Austria, do you currently, on this first day of reopening, uh, use air sterilizers in, in, in your private practices? Um, <clears throat> so far, we are not using uh, air st sterilizers uh, within, the, within the dental setting. So measures have mainly been taken on the protection of the personal levels. We tried, as, as uh, mentioned by the other speakers, really to, um, because we are not in summer yet, uh, having used uh, of uh, opening windows and, and everything and, um, and in surface, uh, surface disinfection measures and uh, also um, if possible, as good as possible, trying the uh, production of aerosol um, treatments or aerosol producing treatments. But it is definitely something that will accompany us uh, within the next next weeks of, of getting back to a more normal work as we will need to also start with period treatments. We will need to start with... Uh, ultrasonic treatments. Um, so, but as Nikos mentioned already, the evidence also by the by the infection rate uh, through um, aerosol is is uh, really really still still lacking and very much at an experimental level. So we will need for definitely for for more more data and and also um, see what what the next next months will bring in this respect. Yeah. Professor Manu, can you comment on the specific type of air sterilizers you're using in your hospital? Our air sterilizer is an uh, ultraviolet sterilizer, and uh, the wind go below, and uh, you will blow outside, and it keeps the window open for all the time. And uh, it can be, we can use it when we practice. So it's kind of safe and for us, and it's kind of, it's don't disturb, disturb us and do harm to us. So that is, I think it's quite quite easy for us to use it and we can put it into the center of our clinic. We can hang it on the wall and to make us safe. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. to the Thank now you. we have no no confirmed case, so no fact in our department no fact in our department and the school was get confirmed with this COVID nineteen. So it might give us the evidence it still work. Okay. Yeah, but if you, after your presentation of all the measures you are taking, it will be very difficult to isolate the cause of which measure was the most effective to the fact that you not have any uh, cases at the moment. Michael. Gerrit, I would have a question um, also to Nikos, because this has been a highly discussed uh, issue, in at least in Europe. Um, it was the real time tracing. You have, uh, it was very impressive, uh, also, uh, mainly optically, uh, but as I understand your speech, 
you you consider this also as a very effective tool in the in the uh, prevention or maybe also um, in in uh, showing the or gathering or gaining more discipline of social distancing. So would you would you um, because this is really discussion in also in regard to uh, data protection in Europe, um, would you recommend this, knowing the Chinese environment, would you recommend this to Europe, uh, real-time tracing? Yes, thank you. Uh, it is uh, something that actually Hong Kong has as a benefit. We are a Chinese and a European environment in, in some ways. So there is a little bit of a cross-fertilization and there are arguments here as well. I have to, of course, say that these have always been anonymized uh, data. So you can't trace the individuals through this data. But the Wait a second, Nikos. You showed us, we could see there was in this building a male of 35-year-olds who had just traveled to London. I think it will be very easy <laughs> for the neighbors to point out who that was. Yes, you are very right on that. Yeah. True, the neighbors will probably have an understanding. On the other hand, I think there is a, it's a society where the, the disease has much less of stigmatization. There is actually no real uh, embarrassing or uh, stigmatization of uh, infected people as such. But yes, of course, I can fully understand that, especially when you see the latest moves of data protection in Europe, that would make many people thrown in, in Europe and it will raise a lot of eyebrows and, and introduce a lot of debates. Now, the discussion, of course, of how you place the border, where you put the red line to say this is now protected private data and this is actually public uh, announced in order to protect the, the public health care, is a debate that is very difficult, and I think it's very subjective. And uh, where your privacy is stopping and then the, the rights of the community and the fight against the pandemic starts, it is something to be debated. So I can't really place this um, discussion in our setup. It's very difficult for me to take uh, a stand. I would say from my personal opinion is that it's a very, very useful tool because it, uh, brings up some togetherness. It shows also to the people that there is serious action being taken, that we are really keeping this on hold. We know what's going on and we can pinpoint to the situation. So the data that you get out of it can also make people hope better and, and uh, have an understanding and feel safer. But of course, it's, it's a very difficult debate because there are arguments from all sides. T to be honest, uh, Michael, when I uh, was looking at the same and probably with a lot of people here in Europe, first my eyebrows raised because this is against anything <laughs> with G GDPR and we know. But then a, a key word I, I underlined and wrote down and what I learned from you, Nikos, is you used the word realistic. And you said this, this tool really helps to assess in a realistic sense where and how large the real risk and the real spread is. And that is something I picked up. It's like, well, there's some of that we could use perhaps in Europe also a bit because now we're scared of everyone and everywhere. Yes. So, um, If I may say, this is the best recipe against fake news. And because we have all witnessed an explosion of misinformation from the beginning of the pandemic, from every level, national and local level, about people dying by the thousands here and by the dozens there, you can at least go in this and, and have a real-time assessment of the situation. So I think it helps in many ways. Thank you. Yes. All right. So, Michael, if you're okay, uh, when I read the questions from our live audience, they really want to take us back to the very practical yes and no questions about certain preventive measures, tools, liquids. So uh, let's take a few of these. Let's see if we... And let's start with the question, do you have any experience with? And if not, then we won't go in. And if, if you do, then we can comment on it. The first one, or, or one of the early ones that came in, was Guillaume Estefa Pardo, who asked, do you have some experience with hypochlorous... Uh, acid to decontaminate, I suppose. Do you have any experience or uh, with that in the clinic? Not me, no. no. Not at the moment. No. no, okay, so sorry, Guillaume, we, then we won't take the discussion there because then it's just purely hy hypothetical. Um, Kandon Effoglu is asking, do you use, do negative ion generators work to reduce the droplets? Do you have any experience with that? Unfortunately, yeah. no, either. Yes. No experience at this point, Michael, also, no? no? Okay, so so let me then say to our virtual audience, thank you for bringing all, up all these measures. I think this is a great source of diving into of uh, potential measures, but at this point, our panel cannot uh, comment. Um, Ketke 
Asnani asked, can you throw us some light on the use of hypo or betadine in the water lines? Any experience with that, gentlemen? I think uh, this, this has been uh, quite clearly shown also what, what we can see from the publication um, that whatever, whatever um, uh, disinfection uh, measure you use, or for example, to give the patients to, uh, to initially rinse me betadine or, um, or uh, super, super oxides, but also chlorhexidine um, is, is effective. Um, so uh, what, what has, been, has been described in the publication, it's a one uh, percent diluted hypoxide, and, and we this is what we've been following also um, within our patients. We asked the patient once they enter their dental environment to rinse for one minute with with uh, uh, one percentage of, of diluted uh, superoxide, and this um, should um, reduce the concentration of virus to a very significant level. Also, betadine and probably also chlorhexidine. And, and Michael, this rinsing, is this just a common dental practice, common sense, or did you increase this because of, uh, as, as a, preve a preventative measure? Um, it's, um, it has been a, a standard procedure prior to surgical interventions, also during period treatments, but um, it has become a standard procedure for every patient before he's opening, before he's getting uh, examined through a dentist or uh, when, when he's on the dental chair. Yeah, so you increased that measure to a broader scope yes. of procedures. Yes. Uh, any experience with rinsing? Uh, we have quite some questions about that uh, on your end, uh, Nikos or uh, Professor Manny. From our side, I think the major guideline we have was to use chlorexidine. I know from publications from China that there is also peroxide being recommended. Now, all this is done on the basis of common sense and, and reducing the the at least temporarily, the load. Now, how efficient would be and would there be some clinically significant difference between one or the other? I think right now there is nothing to suggest one or the other. And again, many studies that actually have been cited, they're older uh, in vitro rather than actually having any, any clinical relevance. So I think as long as you do it, probably there is not much of an influence what you're using. All right, next question, again about uh, protective equipment. I find it an interesting perspective. Uh, Marlon103 is uh, the handle, asks, do the patients wear any protective equipment or do they just come in with their day clothes and lie in the chair? What, what is your experience and, and protocol there? So in our clinic, it's like this, that we have uh, a highly reduced number of patients entering the clinic, just also to main the maintain the, um, uh, the distance between the patients. Um, every patient is wearing um, a protective mask, a sur surgical mask, once he's entering the, the private, uh, the dental practice and, and the clinic in order to protect um, other patients and also to protect the, the staff until the treatment starts. Uh, they are asked to, to perform hand disinfection before they, they go to the to the to the dental unit, um, yes, and this is this is uh, what what it, every patient has to do before hmm. before we start the treatment and the examination. And Professor Manu, Manu, in your hospital, any any protective equipment for the patients? Or has he? Oh, it looks like he's frozen up. He's <laughs> okay. been looking like that for for a long time. Okay. Ah, the, you you are back, I think, at least in audio. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm afraid we had uh, the same uh, hiccup as we had uh, a few hours earlier. We know it's temporarily, so it uh, will come back. Um, in the meantime, I want to congratulate our virtual audience because I see in the live chat that they are now also starting to help each other. We saw a question about what if I have a practice with only one chair? How much time should I put between patients? And Lawrence Blackie Swart is already sharing his knowledge about 15 minutes in between. Ketki Asnani, who asked the questions about treating the, uh, the uh, water lines, is now asking the broader community to ask if they have any experience with putting betadine in the water line. So this is going very well congratulations to our audience and thanks for being together this this afternoon in europe this evening in asia and and this morning in the americas and and sharing this information with each other 
I see a question from Victor Palari, who is a, a regular and loyal participant in these EO Just Ask. He's asking, which measurements do you recommend in case of patients with comorbidities, which we know are a, a, a great risk factor with COVID-19, for example, diabetes, hypertension, uh, for example, in the case of ex um, extractions, do you take any extra measurements there? Yes, um, in in the in the acute phase, you know, you know, it's it depends. Um, it depends on the um, if it's if it's not a really urgent treatment, we we definitely in the acute phase, we we really try to postpone it and and really um, we could see also the patients with the comorbidities as at least in our country patients they're very much aware of what are the comorbidities they really refrain from from going to see the dentist if there was not uh, any anything uh, se severe to that um, um, but you know if there is if a, if a diabetic uh, patient or if a if a patient with a uh, cardiac or, or respiratory disease patient, and especially if, if, if he's older, um, is is having an acute abs abscess formation around the wisdom teeth, of course there's a there's a need for for treatment. And um, but we really, I think, and this was the was the main uh, was the main um, issue in the in the acute phase to really um, make the patients. Stay at home as long as long as possible, and really, really come and come and see the dentist if it's um, if it's if it's really urgent. And um, we've been we've been doing these treatments also in in patients with with uh, comorbidities, but we kept the same same measures. But I think the the most most relevant point is that you pre-screen the patients already on the telephone. And this is what um, uh, what had been communicated. So we, we really had said also in front of our clinic, there's there's someone uh, someone present doing the triage, doing the measurements of, of temperature and, and everything. So and also these patients with comorbidities usually they are very compliant because they are very much aware of their of their risk of the individual risk. And I think this is the major point to pre-screen and and. Um, really um especially in these times when we were, did not have too much information about about the virus so pre-screening and triage um by a, by a telephone contact to the patient i think is the most effective measure yeah, thanks for sharing michael and what i would like to because we're starting to get to the near and uh, near the end of our, uh, our of our meetup in the meantime uh, professor manyi is reconnecting because we uh, briefly lost him he'll be back with us uh, soon we talk about reopening. We talk a lot and we see a lot of questions about which procedures to do and to don't. Now, in this case, we, we, we have been talking a lot about dentistry in general, but obviously we are with a community of implant dentists. And I would like to round up this panel with, with exploring uh, where we stand on doing implant procedures again. And why would we postpone them any longer or why perhaps could we even get started with them? Uh, Nikos, if I may start with you, what, what what is your take on that? Where, yes. where is implant dentistry in this whole f moving from lockdown to back to practice? Yes, I think implant dentistry, at least in the first phase of the pandemic, might have been pushed aside because it is uh, in the majority of the procedures an elective uh, treatment. It's a treatment which usually comes on a healthy background because we put implants on healthy conditions. And of course, it's a treatment that can wait for a while. You can put it off for a few weeks. You can put it off for a few months, most likely. But of course, uh, what we're looking ahead now is not anymore a couple of weeks of acute situation. I think we're getting into a period of a balance where we have to practice dentistry and we have to practice together with the virus threat. And implant dentistry can be probably practiced to a stage because it involves maybe less uh, risky procedures when it comes to the aerosol, although surgical procedures with drilling will still involve some uh, generation of the aerosol. But uh, I cannot see it really separately. I think dentistry will require the full, the full set of, of, uh, of uh, services. You can't do implants if you can't really treat gingivitis and periodontitis. How are you going to treat gingivitis without ultrasonic scalers, for example? So eventually, I think 
we cannot, it's a chain reaction, it's a domino effect, and we can't isolate procedures for the long term and say this is what we're going to be doing for the next few months or a year or even more. So I think essentially we should probably focus on, first of all, assessing the true risk, finding out where are the risk points, because there are risky points in the whole chain and, and less risky points. And aerosols might include risks, but in different ways. It's also about how to schedule your appointments. For example, patients at high risk uh, or comorbidities, I would, I would put them on the very first of the day when the clinic is still uh, just opening up. We, I think, have to identify the risks, find the strategies, streamline the procedures, manage the patient flow uh, to minimize the risks, and, and then move on. Because I think it is uh, unrealistic to put uh, dental care on hold for long periods of time. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And uh, it's a great and broad perspective. It looks like, Professor Manier, we've been able to reconnect with you. Let's uh, try one more time. I, I asked to you all, uh, does implant dentistry take a special place in the way back to the full operational? Can we put it forward? Should we postpone it longer? What, what is your experience in the last few weeks and months? I am afraid that we will not over, overcome these connection problems. Now, unfortunately, uh, your frame uh, keeps uh, keeps freezing. We we see your message that you can still hear us. So I think with that, Michael, it's time to uh, to start to close this session. Don't go away just yet, because I tell you in a second how you can use and share the recordings of this live EO. Just ask. But first, I want to give the word to Michael Payet. Michael. So I would really like to thank to, to all of you, to Professor Manier and, and Nikos for, for taking the time, for accepting the invitation. And I think there would be, at least I have noted, uh, many more questions that I would have liked to, to address. Uh, maybe just last, very last one uh, to both of them, because we, we really, really are, this is, a, this is also a consequence of the, of the lockdown. Um, how can we use, um, and also since Nikos is an expert, dental um, online training um, in these days? And for how long do you think it will be able that uh, it can compensate the life training for our students? Maybe just a short uh, sentence from both of you, Professor Manyi, you're, you're involved in your, in your uh, in the university environment. So that's, I think that's a topic I very much like the app of how to train your, your patients. Uh, but Nikos, maybe you can give us just a short idea of uh, the capacity of online training during COVID-19. Yes, thank you. I think there is a true explosion of online learning possibilities. And in a way, this is a great opportunity. Uh, but of course, learning should not become opportunistic because of that, because we see also a major inflation of possibilities, but people uh, cannot just follow whatever pops up on your timeline or, or your email. You have to have some sort of a strategy, which is based on what you really need to grow into, what you need to learn, how do you see your practice in the next few years, plot your steps and, and target the things that you really need in order to grow. So I think for now we are having e-learning as uh, the only capacity because all the other institutes are closed. I think it will stay with us for a long time because the opening of the universities doesn't mean that we are going back to a normality. I'm afraid that traveling will become difficult in the next uh, months to maybe even years. And the difficulties, it's very difficult to predict even right now. I do not know when the borders will open. And when the borders open, I do not know how many flights will happen. And I also don't know how expensive the flight tickets will be. So this will direct our behavior for many months or even years. Major events, major congresses, major courses have been put on hold. And when they resume, will we be able and willing to travel in the same way and at the same cost and in the same capacity? It, it remains to be seen. So I think e-learning for now is a great opportunity but it has to be matched with a very good structure from our side, which will direct you to the resources rather than get the resources uh, on a random basis and see what's on today on the channels. Yeah. Super, thank you so much, Nikos. And I think that was also good and a necessary perspective that with online 
education this also this will will stay with us for for quite a time i can see this also has been a boost i can see uh, both of my kids have become expert in, in virtual conferences so uh, this has already at least been something good so i think uh, to all of you for having been here sorry garrett for stressing the time frame uh, it's, it's been okay. an enormous pleasure and uh, thank you again Yes, and to all those viewers who are still with us, congratulations. Again, this is a lighthearted form of education that EO is offering every month. And you found your way to the EO channel here on YouTube. And if you haven't, haven't done so, please hit that subscribe button right now so you'll be the first to know when a new EEO just ask is scheduled and what it is about because for example in two weeks already on May 7th I'm connecting with Professor Ronald Young where we're going to talk about rich preservation and again we're going to try to just answer as many of your questions as we can in that specific session as well um, if you know anyone who might find it interesting to have a look at these presentations at that at this discussion please know that this exact link, the one that you are watching right now, as soon as we stop the broadcast, is also the place where you can see the recording and it will be available here on YouTube for the future to, to come. So please copy that link, share it with all the relevant people in your network who might find this interesting and, and useful. And with that, I just have one final question. Make sure you remember to join our, first, our next EEO Just Ask I'm looking forward to see you next time.